This is The Storied Outdoors, a podcast somewhere between Lewis and Tolkien and Lewis and Clark, finding clarity in the stories we tell and the adventures that shape us. My name is Brad Hill, and I'm joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, Brian Gill. We, man, I am so fired up. Fired up being the key word is Brian is sitting with me. And we're sitting next to my fire pit in my backyard in Mobile, Alabama. You know, I, I wish that we could share more about the day. Oh, my goodness. But let's, I'm riding so high we, today. <laughs> this has been a phenomenal day. We're not even going to tip our hand to it, but you'll find out in the fall. Oh, my goodness. We got to wait till the we fall. We got to wait till the fall. Oh, my God. I know. I know. Okay. What an epic day, though. Epic day. Um, Boy, yeah. we're foreshadowing hard, <laughs> hard. It's, hey, is it worth it? It's worth it. It's ounce, worth it. Every ounce of the foreshadowing. <laughs> That's right. Wow. <laughs> I didn't even think about that as we were pre, pre, pre-gaming for this recording. But yeah, that's a, what a great day. But we're, we want to talk a little bit about um, the introduction of this episode that we're sharing today. It's going to be a little bit different. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, as, as a lot of our, our listeners and people who've kind of hung out with us in the last uh, few years on Instagram know that this past uh, weekend we were at the, uh, the Cahaba Brewery for the International Fly Fishing Film Festival. Yeah. And we had our booth set up, and it really was a lot of fun. Uh, absolute blast, yeah. We, we had so many, I mean, it was like a family reunion up there because so many of the people that we have on the show – we're there in person. Yeah. And so we've only ever seen them on, um, you know, on Zoom. And so to see them in person was really, really a blast. And to, to give hugs yep. to people that we've become friends with digitally and over this recording, we got to see them in person. You know, I, I think I made the comment, I wish everybody was walking around with their Instagram handle on their shirt. Because <laughs> there were some faces that I, I recognized, but names I didn't know. But then there were also people that we knew very well and some that we, were, we had said over the years, we really got to get you on the podcast. And right. We actually did. We, right. we set up our recording stuff and we actually had four episodes, not four episodes, four, four interviews. Yeah, a little isolated interviews when folks came and sat down in the hot seat, a.k.a. the liar's stump. The liar's stump. <laughs> <laughs> Storytellers welcome. Storytellers welcome. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, we had... We had Andre, we had Paul, we had Terry, yeah. uh, Andrew Witten, Andrew Witten, and we had Robin, Robin Sims. Sims. We finished strong with Robin Sims. We did, and <laughs> man, uh, we got a little bit more to say about that one. But yeah, what you're about to hear is the recordings from the International Fly Fishing Film Festival, and I think it went pretty well. We had a blast. It was so much fun. So you'll hear, you know, normally you know someone's on Zoom with us and. Um, Brian and I are on in our respective offices and we're recording, you know, over zoom, but this time we're in person. You can hear the kind of the hum of the hum of people walking around to the booths and, you know, checking out different, you know, people's artwork and, um, you know, different guides yep. and shops and guys tying flies. Um, there may be a random person yelling in the background. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I yeah. mean, that's, it was just that kind it of just atmosphere. Fun. It was a great atmosphere. And, right. um, so it was good. So uh, just sit back and relax and enjoy, you know, some uh, candid stories from people sitting in the hot seat at the International Fly Fishing uh, Festival and the Cahaba Brewing Company, which was awesome also, by the way. That's the first time I've really gone there and really hung out yep. at the brewery, you know, and uh, a lot of basketball was going on because March Madness. So yep. it's a great atmosphere up there. Um we had so much fun. So sit back and enjoy and, uh, and listen to a few stories. We're coming. We're live today. First time we've ever been live before at Cahaba Brewing Company here in Birmingham, Alabama for the International Fly Fishing Film Festival today. So we're, all of our friends are here. Everybody, a lot of our friends, a lot of our followers, a lot of people we follow and a lot of great organizations. We got some, uh, we got, we're sitting right next to the Mayfly Project and, uh, our buddy Andre 
It works with the Mayfly Project, and he's gonna he's our he's our first guest of the day. First so. guest of the day. So, Andre, welcome. Hello, hello, fellas. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Good. So good to be here. So good to see everybody out supporting these causes, supporting our community. It's just absolutely incredible. Man, what about this community? It is so so cool. The Alabama fly fishing community is something special. Yeah, it's something that you know it's really hard to explain. You know, I mean, it's it's kind of a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different their own stories, and so uh, you know that's kind of one of the things we want to do today is is kind of capture some of these stories. Man, you got a fishing story? Do you have an outdoor story? Do you have a, a connection with anything? Mayfly Project, fly fishing, outdoors, whatever. Man, we want to hear it. Yeah, I do. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I, I think the thing about Alabama is, and I travel a lot for work, which is going to lead us into my fishing story. But, you know, we um, if you ask most people around the country, Alabama isn't supposed to have fly fishing. Yeah. You know, that's kind of the general uh, feeling on the whole matter. Fly yeah, fly fishing in Alabama right. is unheard of. Right. And that's the beauty of it. It kind of is. It kind of is unheard of, which is one of the things that keeps it so pristine, you know, yeah. so good. And we have so much variation, different species. You know, the Cahaba is one of the highest rated uh, for the number of species and a waterway in the country. Um, it's just incredible what we have here. You know, I'm in the Appalachians all the time. The, the waterways we have for these red eye, they call them Bama Brookies for a reason, and it's a good reason. A good I, can, reason. I can verify and qualify that. Um, these fish are beautiful. They fight. They're in wonderful places, wonderful places. Um, you know, what they're doing here for the uh, film festival, talking about the Red Eye Slam, it's great to get the word out. Like Matt and them say, you know, you're going to protect what you love, but you you have to know about it in order to fall in love with it, right? Oh, so so true. getting the good word out there. And I tell you, this community is so embracing. You know, they don't want to push people out. They're not looking to be exclusive. Yeah. You know, they're not looking to be elite. They're looking to um, grow the community out and make everyone in it continually better. Mm. You know, and that, that's rare to find no matter what kind of hobby or activity that you're into. Uh, the inclusivity of that, you know, I know we talk about, and being Christians, we talk about this in the church as well, finding good small groups, finding people who are there yep. to take care of other people, to have a servant leadership mindset is so hard to find in business, in life, in faith and in fishing and we have that here in alabama it's just incredible um and then just fly fishing in general it's incredible where it will take you as a fly fisher person if you're willing to get out yeah. there in the world and explore yeah, it absolutely. for my for my fishing story speaking of which it'll take you better. it'll take you to some odd better. stuff <laughs> yeah so i travel for work you know i do a lot of uh, i run a security firm uh nationally and so uh, we have a, a, a one of our big accounts is Chick-fil-A, uh -huh. and that takes me all over the place. So at the Chick-fil-A, we were doing a project in um, Upper East Side, Manhattan. We get out there, and they send me because this is a really hard project in a 150-year-old building. You know, oh, wow. um, while I'm up there, I fly up. Of course, I'm going to bring my fly fishing gear. Of course. So I've got my, my backpack. I got a tube, you know, uh, with my fly gear in it. The whole thing, ready to rock and roll. I get done with the job site, I survey it, I do all of my due diligence, I'm off the clock, right? So um, what do I do with myself until I fly out in the morning? Well, I'm gonna go fish. I mean, naturally, let's be, naturally, let's be serious. Naturally. So I, uh, I figure out the train system, I get myself over into Central Park. When I get there, I get out and I go over to, uh, to what they call the lock. I was going to the Harlem Mirror. Uh -huh. Start on the north end and I'm gonna work my way down and fish the creek all the way down. So there's something called the Glen Span Arch. Okay. So you can start at beautiful location. It, it can be fairly easy to forget aside from all of the sirens uh, that you hear flying around everywhere on the road, uh, that you're in New York City. And so I get out there, and this little black squirrel catches my eye. Oh, we've and seen I mean, I'm black talking squirrels. about yes. stark, yes. stark black squirrel. Yeah. And, um, and I'm like, man, alive. So I'm looking at it, I'm taking video of it, you know, just being a tourist. Yeah, you know, right. Just being a goober out there. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like, man, that is so cool. I hear another one rustling in the leaves behind me. And uh, I, I finish my video and I go to look at the one that's behind me. It is, uh, it is not a squirrel. It is an adult lady uh, in a raccoon costume. <laughs> and she is standing about 10 feet behind me, give or take, up the, the pavement trail. And uh, she's scratching at all the leaf litter. And she's throwing pine cones around. I mean, it's, it's a scene, man. Oh, my god. I'm waiting for, like, Ashton Kutcher to pop out. Right. You know, tell me I'm on punk. You, you know, any, anything. No, no. She was very serious. She's serious. Deadly so, serious. So this is an adult lady. She's got a costume on. A full costume on. Like a raccoon costume. Like a full raccoon costume. Okay. Actually, I posted a photo of it on the Alabama Fly 
uh, forum. If you haven't seen it yet, pull me up in there wow. and flip through the photos. You'll see what I'm talking oh about. Goodness. So this starts at the Glenspan Arch. Beautiful place. I'm trying to take photos of it. Kind of difficult because there she is following me around. Now, how I got elected that day, I don't know. Oh, don't know. you were she's chosen following. one. She's following. So she's following me. <laughs> so I don't know what the mileage is. I'm sure Google Maps could tell us if we wanted to find out for sure. But a half mile, three quarter mile, I'm fishing up and down this stream that runs through uh, Central Park <laughs> up on the north side of it. As I'm going through, she follows me everywhere that I go. I'm back casting, and every time I start to back cast, or if I, a lot of it's real brushy up there, so you're roll casting out. And when she hears the noise, you'll hear her whimper and then skitter off. Meep. Skitter, 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 and off she goes. And I'm like, listen, man. I'm so I'm thinking to myself, do not engage. Do not engage. No, 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 no. no. Do not engage. Pretend like it's not happening. <laughs> The more uh, that I engage with her, the more this is going to escalate, yeah. right. right? So I take off, and I get to the Har Harlem Mirror, and when I get out there, it's getting a little busier. People are around, walking their dogs, letting their kids play. So I'm fishing in the actual pond up there, and uh, I'm like, all right, man, I I'm, I'm overdue for some pizza. You know, I got to get some of this famous New York pizza. I wanted a hot dog, a bagel, all the cheesy stuff, uh, not knowing if I was going to come up uh, back up there, you know, yeah. have a chance at these kind of things yeah. again. Right. I'm starting to pack up my bag, and as I put down my rod and I, I take the reel of it off, she's kind of looking at me over here on the adjacent hillside. She's looking at me. She realizes I'm packing up. She's on all fours, by the way. Has been most of the time trying to be a raccoon. Right. <laughs> she stands up, looks at me, and just turns and walks away like nothing happened, like none of this happened in real life. She just like snapped out of what? it and was gone, man. <laughs> My Get goodness. the old dusty trail right into the sunset. <laughs> Wildest thing in the world. Did you catch any fish? Yeah, I caught a couple of rim out of the Harlem Mirror. Okay. That's about all I could do. Yeah. It, it was still pretty cold, but I wasn't going to miss a chance to try, you know? He's the guardian and, uh, of, 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 the, yeah. of the lakes there. Yeah, by far the biggest thing I caught that day was was that interaction. Was, <laughs> was, yeah, was, was, was old girl in the raccoon costume, no question about it. Oh my! No question goodness. about it. Well, you know, I've seen those. I've seen those characters around Times Square, but I've never seen them in Central Park. <laughs> oh so. yeah, man. Oh yeah. I have to. I'll definitely send you guys the photo. And you know, look. And I mean, even with that, you know, it's so cool. People. Uh, w something about it is just about fly fishing in general. It's just attractive. Yeah. I mean, whether you're somebody so around Alabama looking for a community of people to do life with. Or, you know, if you like to run around in raccoon costumes, you know, we, we're not going to run you off. No. You, know, <laughs> you can follow me as I fish. That's fine. <laughs> it's so funny you say that. You know, we were at uh, DeSoto Falls in North Alabama one time, yeah. and we were fishing in that little pond, just fly fishing. There was a couple, I don't know, from Michigan or something like that. They just yeah. kind of came up, sat down, and they were like, you mind if we watch you fly fish? Because they just thought that it looked really appealing, you know. And, and so you're right. I mean, people, some, there's something just drawn to people who do that and so absolutely. yeah it's kind of a fun thing yeah. so absolutely Andre. It, is it is beautiful i mean to do it's, it's like yeah it, what, it's, it's mesmerizing it really I, mean, really I was is. talking with uh chase bowers who's been on the show before yeah and we were talking about how when somebody's got a beautiful cast yep you know when you do have the room for the back cast you know it is it's cinematic i mean there's a reason yep. these are films we're at the film festival there's a reason there because they're in, you're in a beautiful spot yep so you have this backdrop that's incredible and somebody's cast and it's rhythmic and it's, it's gorgeous so it is like wait what are they doing you know and it pulls people in so oh yeah even people with uh costumes uh costumes oh, yeah <laughs> that's so cool. and there's always so much more to do so much more to know. learn you know more people to meet and so as you uh it's one of those wonderful things where just as soon as you think you're getting good at it you realize how much more you have oh, to learn goodness, and you know it just keeps man. you in it so it true. just keeps you in it so true andre Thanks for sharing the story, man. Good to see you. The pleasure was mine. Yeah, Very we'll talk. We'll you talk both. soon, bud. Thanks, y'all. All right, Paul Terry, epic boogeyman. He's a fly oh, tire, a fly fisherman, uh, one of the staples of the Alabama fly fishing community, uh, joining us here at the Fly Fishing Film Festival. How you doing, Paul? I'm great. How are you guys? Man, we're doing great. We had a. Uh, a, a little bit of an exchange out in the parking lot and ended up with a uh, one of the most beautiful popping bugs I've ever seen. It's black and blue. It's got a epic boogeyman decal on it. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, anytime. Happy to, happy to give out. Uh, love giving these things away. It's a blast. Man, how long have you been tying? I mean, you are, you are probably one of the the premier in, in the state of Alabama. I mean, there's a lot of good people who tie, but you're, you're do, you've done this for a long time, I feel like. No, no, only about four years. What? Yeah. Really? Oh my gosh! 
You learn yeah, quick. Yeah. Uh, about four years ago, my dad gave me his old vice that, that he had, oh gosh, he's probably had it 40 years. Wow. And uh, I took it to uh, Orvis tying night, uh, their, their uh, FT-101 night yes. in Birmingham, not knowing what I was doing and tied the ugliest monstrosity you've ever seen, <laughs> but, uh, but fell into the addiction. Okay, And, and I spent uh, so much time at that vice practicing. Uh, that my wife actually nicknamed it uh, my mistress. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I figure if you're going to have one, right? Uh, right. Yeah, That's you may as well one. be safe, right? Right. So uh, with with a ton of practice and uh, a little bit of creativity, I came up with uh, with uh, an, an idea to turn balsa into poppers. And I started buying blanks. It's, it's uh, balsa. Balsa wood. Uh, balsa, yeah, balsa blanks. Wood. Yep. That you can yeah. just square balsa uh, sticks that you can buy at uh, any craft shop. Yeah. And uh, I cut them into short blanks, and I turn them into uh, shapes, and then I, I paint them or I ink them uh, and uh, coat them with epoxy and, and, and tie uh, tails onto them, uh, depending on the situation they're going to be used to. The fact that you can turn that little popper, that little piece of wood, into something is, oh my gosh, I love that. Right. And it's, it's something that it, it's, it's still a work in progress, still in development. Yeah. I'm still matching the ideal hook. Okay. Uh, uh, for the for the shape of the popper head, it's uh, something I'm working on, uh, but so far it's been working out pretty well. Man, I've got my father, my, my mother-in-law, her dad had some old flies that looked similar to one you have, but I don't think they were balsa wood. I think that they may have been cork. Probably cork. Yeah, they I are, think that know. was like the traditional. Was, was that what like it started out? The traditional out start out. Balsa cork. seems a little bit more durable than the cork, I would think. Right. It's, when it's coated, it is. It is. Yeah. It is. Uh, I haven't had any fall apart on me. I banged them against stumps and, uh, yeah. and a few rock walls, and they seem to be holding up. Um, of course, I haven't really thrown a whole lot of cork. I do have some. Uh, Wade Blevins was good enough to send me a bag of cork, yeah. and I have a yeah some some old cork too. Oh wow! And, uh, I have a few that I put together. I haven't tried throwing them yet. Um, I just haven't had. Uh, I've only put a few of them together. I haven't had uh, the opportunity to put them out to, in, into the test yet, but uh, we'll see how that works out. Oh. But uh, the balsa has shown to be pretty durable. So your dad was a fly tire? Dad, uh, dad never did, really did take off with it. He, he thought he might be interested in it, but uh, it's just not something he really took a liking to. Yeah. His, his vice maybe was used three or four times, and he okay. put it away. And after about 40 years, he gave it to me. Wow. So did, y'all, did you grow up fly fishing? I did. What was so? What was some of the earliest memories of fly fishing that you've had? This in the Pacific Northwest is where we grew up. Did you really? We did. Oh. Okay. So we would fish for uh, native trout and uh, salmon during the run. Wow. And uh, it, it, was, it was amazing. We would camp on the side of uh, the Cowlitz River, uh, south of Tacoma, Washington. Oh man. And uh, we'd catch our salmon, and we would we were catching cook people. So That's something I never caught is so, like the yeah, salmon. salmon. Like that. Oh, during the run, amazing fish. Dream, amazing dream fish, fish to man. Catch the fish that. and clean it and eat it right there on the right spot. Right there. Oh, I man. bet that's some it's of the best fish. The best fish you could have. Cooked be over an alder wood fire. It's oh, that sounds Those like are, a trip we need to take. Yes, yes, you do. get Paul to take Add us up to there. the list. Add it Add to the, the list. list. Let's plan the yes. Let's yeah, do we'll stop by Idaho on the way over to the Pacific oh, Northwest. Oh, yeah, do yeah, make a cutty trip out of it. <laughs> yeah, too. Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. That's, that's what we did. That is so that's cool. What we did, and then when uh, Dad retired from the Air Force in the late '80s, we moved to the South, and we put our fly rods up because you know there there weren't any trout down here, and and, and we were the type who associated fly fishing and trout like so many people do. Right. Right. And I guess it was about five years ago, we were in Blue Ridge, and we found out there were trout down here, and I picked oh, man, the old fly rod back up. I mean, really, the genesis of our, our the show was a trip to Blue, Blue Ridge, Ridge, Georgia, to go catch fish, and that's where we, we started to think, man, we were listening to right. an audio book and about, from John Girak, and uh, on the way to Blue Ridge to get in the mindset of listening to right. fly fishing stories, and... Man, it's so beautiful there. Oh, we, man. We both really caught great, great fish in that trip. Really Tacoa River is such a trout-rich river. I, and I guess it stays cold coming out of that. Uh, the, that below the, the, the below Lake Blue Fontaine? Ridge Dam. The Blue right. Ridge? Is yes. that what it is? Yeah. Okay. Man. Yeah. And Angela and I, uh, on our, she, she actually uh, 
took me up there, treated me to a trip uh, for our anniversary up there, and uh, uh, it was a guided trip down the Tacoa in the tailwater. That's a keeper right and there. I'm, I'm telling you, she, she, she's incredible. And uh, we had a double hookup. She caught a brown, I caught a rainbow. Oh, uh, man. Uh, awesome. We were fishing with Bowman, uh, Bowman fly fishing up there. Uh, they took real good care of us. Uh, but that kind of reignited the flame for me. Yeah. And it, it was it was uh, it, it's been a great run since. I mean, I've, it's I've learned a lot. Yeah. Uh, I've learned that trout. Uh, yeah, they're great yeah. where they belong. Yeah. Uh, around here, I, you don't have to go very far to find great fish, and oh, uh, I'm not going to really go that far to fish. You know, that's to. that's such a great point. I mean, catching you know, a lot of people who listen, they think they associate trout and fly fishing, right. but catching Alabama bass, uh, red eye bass. Big brim, big bluegill, shellcracker. One of the, my favorite fish to catch on a fly is a shellcracker, which they they fight so hard yeah, for their size. Yes, so. they do. But one of the things I've learned, I have I have a, a creek in the Black Warrior drainage that runs literally 400 yards from my front door, and I have at least five species of native fish there. One of which I've never caught before about three weeks ago. Wow. Uh, it was a red spotted sunfish. Oh, uh, yeah, I've caught those. You've caught one I've of caught those. those down, right. down in Libya. Well, I misidentified it. It was a friend of mine who corrected me. Uh, uh, Corey Kendrick corrected me on it. Corey knows uh, his species. He knows his species. I think he was the one. I put it up on Instagram. I was like, what in the world is this right. thing? Well, it looks so tropical. Yeah. And I think Corey was He's the one exactly that right. commented. Right. It was like, that's a red Right. Corey red did, spotted. and uh, I think Jake Vincent also uh, corrected me on it. But I, I did. I misidentified it because I'd didn't. i never yeah. seen one Never before. seen one, yeah. Uh, but they're in there. They're in. They're in the creek with, uh, that runs by my house, and uh, it's just not a very heavily populated creek. It's it's a little urbanized. Populations yeah. are down, but uh, there are fish there, and they're native, and uh, it's right there by the house. Ain't no fish I, in there, no way. Ain't, ain't none. No, ain't, ain't no fish in that creek, no way. <laughs> ain't, no, ain't no fish in there. <laughs> so you don't have to go very far to catch high quality fish. Right. That's true. On a fly rod. That's cool. Yeah. What's your What's your go to for like a sunfish? What's your go-to uh, uh, fly? Fly Samson bug. Absolutely, absolutely, Sam's man. One Sam's bug. one bug in the chartreuse legendary. or blue. Yeah, chartreuse. Chartreuse, chartreuse is uh, is deadly. Yes, I mean, is. oh my goodness, that's one of the original ones. I feel yeah. like that I used. Yeah. That's that that Wade sent to us. Um, it catches. I mean, it's literally a one bug. I mean, you it can is. catch anything off of that. Anything. Uh, I've never caught anything. a trout off of it, but anything in fresh, like in, hey, in Alabama. I've heard they'll I'm take gonna it. Try, I'm going to try because we're going to. I'm going to be out with Chase in Wyoming. Uh huh. And uh, we, we're going to be river fishing, but there is a lake there. Uh huh. And late afternoon, when those the, the grasshoppers are flying, I'm going to throw Sam's one bug in hopes that I can catch a trout. How about on that? One, one of Sam's one bug. <laughs> I've heard it's been done. Um, I have, and as far as I know, I'm the only one. But I have caught a skipjack on one. Oh wow! I did it last year in in uh, Florence. How about that? You know, what if you put a uh, Paul Terry special double scoop underneath of Sam's one bug? Oh, that'd be a uh, there you go. That'd be a good combination. A double double threat. <laughs> there, you go. there you that go. That double scoop's the only thing that we could that Stephen Rockers caught trout on the day that we went up to uh, oh, the right. Nakalula well, that day. That's funny. <laughs> well, that, that's uh, I came up with that idea for Gadsden. Oh, is that Actually, what that was for? Right. It's, yeah. If you if you look at the profile, it's it's a profile of just about any insect larva you see. Yeah. But the colors are uh, power bait. Yeah. That's, to me, it was a no true. brainer for yeah. any tailwater. It's a yeah. no brainer. Oh, it's brilliant. And I claim no copyrights to it. You guys just tie up all you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, man, speak about this Alabama fly fishing community. What uh what. What have you seen in your last few years of how this thing has grown? I have made more friends in mm. this in the past few years, for four years, five years, than uh, than in the previous forty-five years of life. Wow! Um, and and they're and they're great friends. Wow! And that's just from a from a personal perspective, but from a community perspective. I've never seen a group of people care about people so much and mm. look after people's well-beings. Uh, I, I made a, I think I made a social post about something that uh, could have been, it could have been interpreted as a as a a, a cry for help, mm. which it wasn't, but it could have been. Right. And I had people calling me because of that from post. The fly fishing community, just to make sure. 
just to and check it was, on it was you. Simply something about a bad day, and all it was yeah. was just maybe I was having a rough day. But I had people checking on me. Um, and it's it's little things like that, just from people who I've been fishing with, and mm. it uh, it's kind of opened my eyes to what people are supposed to be and people should be. Yeah, so that is so true. A, a true community is thinking about the betterment of the other person, not yourself. Not and I feel yourself. like that is such a, a beautiful thing and it's what's happening with this community. And, uh, you know, everybody here is so generous, so giving. You're, you know, you're right there with them, giving away these flies that take you, uh, you know, a long time that you're, you, you, I mean, just everybody's so generous with their time, with their, uh, they're, they're promoting other people. I mean, it's just, a, it's a thing of beauty, really. It really is. I mean, and that's what, that's the thing people are hungry for too, right? It's right. community. That's exactly it's, right. To be known, really. I mean, it gets down to brass tacks as people's desire to be known. And, and the fly fishing community seems to do a really, I don't know why, but they seem to do a really beautiful job at that. Yeah. Right, for sure. Well, man, we love what you're doing. I love seeing all the things you tie and all the fish you catch, man. Keep up the good work, Paul. I'll sure do it. You guys all right. We got doing. Andy Whitten you. here. Thanks you guys sharing. probably follow along on Instagram with him. Um, Man, thanks for stopping by. Yes, sir. You're in the hot seat, man. Yeah. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Don't be nervous. We're just having uh, a conversation. Yeah. So you got a story that we don't know the premise of. We don't know anything about it, but we want to hear it. All right. So uh, I'm a smallmouth guy. Okay. Uh, pretty much strictly smallmouth. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. I'm 28. I've been out of school for 10 years. And I think it was my freshman year of high school. I was floating a creek that I fish a lot now, but uh, I grew up fishing it. But it was actually uh, probably the worst day of fishing I've ever had <laughs> as far as fishing goes. Because Man. Now, were you fly fishing? You no, I wasn't. This was before I fly fish. Okay, before you were fly fishing. Okay. So, uh, so me and two buddies were in a 10-foot flat bottom uh-huh. floating this creek, right? It's about a seven- or eight-hour float. That's a long time in a flat yeah, bottom. Yeah, it's a long time. So like, I'm in the middle, right? I'm not having to paddle. I'm just fishing. I'm, yeah. the, I'm the luxury guy. You're in the sweet yeah, spot. You're yeah. in the sweet spot. <laughs> so, uh, That's where I try to sit. <laughs> so we're going down through there, right? We well, he's, he's bank beating with crawls. Yeah. Uh, it was a uh, power bait chigger crawl. Okay. Right? So I believe in chigger crawls. So shout out to them. But, but uh, so I don't know how big this fish really was. I seen him for a second, right? So... It's hard for where I fish to catch one unless you're on like Pickwick or on the river, right, to get over three pounds. Right. But I would say this fish pushed probably five. In a creek. In a creek. Oh my goodness. It's huge. So I'm I'm beating huge. the bank, right? Going up there, not catching any fish, right? Beating the bank. And I flipped this chigger crawl up there and it's most of it's real muddy banks. So where it slopes off you can you can see, but it's real muddy water. Right. So I just flipped this chigger crawl in there, and all of a sudden I see this just, whoosh, right? And it's a flash. giant fish, right? Uh-huh. Hits it, takes my crawl, runs with it, and I fight him just long enough to get the, the line tight, uh-huh. and it just snapped. Instantly. Instantly. Oh, my. So another thing that makes this trip stick out to me, right, is that uh, about probably about 20 or 30 minutes later, we was going down through there, and there was this gravel bar in the middle. Yeah. And there was this log sticking up, and my two buddies was like, "Man, we don't need to hit that." And it was a quick run, so. Uh-huh. We, and both my buddies at the time were pretty big dudes, and we yeah. was probably over the weight limit on this boat. <laughs> Maxing out that flat. Yeah. Bottom, huh? So, <laughs> so we ended up getting sideways, and hit this log with the side of the boat, and uh-huh. it kind of tilts one way and goes right that way, and sinks it. The oh, starts taking on. Sinks it. Then just and take on like, water. You say it sunk. It sunk straight. How to the far bottom. into this seven seven hour trip are you? Two hours. Oh man! So like, we'll say like a quarter of the way. Yeah. So uh, it was about five foot of water out there, and that boat felt like it weighed a ton. Oh my god! So gosh. like it was, it took me, him, and that other dude a lot to get it out of there. Oh. But uh, gosh, lost man. all the food, lost all the drinks, lost two rods. Oh. <laughs> it was horrible. You, you I don't even you remember bad, catching bad, a bad fish that fishing. day, dude. So, like, to me, to me, that's that's smallmouth fishing. That's smallmouth fishing. That's smallmouth fishing. <laughs> like, it's just, it's not fun. 
it's, it's not for the week, but it's uh, when it works, it works. Was there anything redeemable about that trip? Yeah, when we got home. When you got yeah, <laughs> you, made, you made it home. My buddy had some bacon that his granddad had bought somewhere at some meat shop or something. Best yeah. bacon I've had to this day. <laughs> <laughs> that was the only Bacon good thing about the day. That was a great part of the trip. Huh? Oh, <laughs> my gosh, man. I think we've all been there those days that just nothing goes right. Yeah, the only thing good is the meal and the drink at the end, at of, the the end of the day. At the end of the day. I mean, oh, I've had a lot of days where it all worked, and it, I've caught some really nice fish and some really nice fish on a fly. But Tell us about your best smallmouth. Well, that's something new to Brad and me. We've only caught yeah. a couple with Wade Blevins. And, um, Up there in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Yeah, so what is uh, – Somewhere what's, in Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah, Tennessee. <laughs> Tennessee don't have smallmouth, dude. <laughs> go to Michigan somewhere. Yeah. Keep going north. Yeah, go north. We don't have them down here. Yeah. But my biggest fish on a fly rod, it would be 3.14 is what he weighed on the scale. Nice. Is it a smallmouth? Yeah, smallmouth. Oh, my God. Oh, and that was in about one. 14 inches of water. You're kidding me. Nah. That thing was just sitting there. Yeah, and I caught him on a size six woolly booger. What? Uh, just stripping yeah. in the. Just, well, I, the woolly I booger don't do is. Good. I'm telling you, the woolly booger is the most versatile fly. Oh, it's fly hands down. down. Brad, you've caught you probably caught ten species everything, on the woolly booger. Everything. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't fish them a lot. But I guess it's just because I know they work. But yeah. like, I'll give you a little secret here, right? It's purple. Uh oh. Purple. purple. Any purple. color you want, color as, long you want. As, as, long as, purple. as long as it's purple. <laughs> yeah. So like, like a size four or size six purple woolly booger. Oh man. With just a little shine. You don't want a whole lot, in my opinion, but that's the first fly that I tied. Was, yeah. a, was a size six woolly yeah. booger. Same. I, it may have been a yeah. I think it was size six. Yeah. And um, I caught a I caught a rainbow on the Elk River. Yeah. Uh, that was my goal for the day was to catch it. And that was with Brad actually. Yeah. And uh, it was on Father's Day, right after your dad passed away. That's right. And um, but man, that purple woolly booger. Yeah. Holy cow! It'll catch fish. Oh, no, it does. It's like. And what's crazy is is the, is we have a field and stream there in town, right? Yeah. And uh, they sold some flies, like. Most of it dry flies. I don't know why they sell dry flies in Florence, but it's whatever. Yeah. But it was like uh, they had a purple woolly booger. Wow. And I bought one, and it was just. Fish after fish after fish after fish. So, I time. What's it supposed to imitate? Like it's a, like a, a little, fish? like a little bait fish. Bait yeah. fish. Yeah. I, yeah. I catch more fish on small stuff. Yeah. Most of the time, like I tie, I tie big flies just because I like to. But, yeah. But most of the time, man, it's I've caught three smallmouth that broke three pounds. Wow. And two of them come off of woolly buggers. Oh my goodness. One of them come off a monstrosity of a popper. Mm. That shouldn't even I shouldn't even caught that fish. I mean that's a that's I was a, standing there on my phone and I heard my I heard oh. <laughs> and I was like what? And Wait. Then, <laughs> but yeah, it, I'd say a purple woolly booger man is is the way to go. That's cool. It, I don't do good on any other color. Yeah. Yeah. Brad, you've had some success on an olive. Olive. So I don't olive do good on olive at all. Really? Yeah. I don't know why. And I don't I don't strip flies mostly. I I'm more of a drift kind of guy, so mm. like I'll. It's like if I if I'm standing on a rock, right on a run, and I think well the fish are probably sitting on this seam right here, 20 yards below me. I'll throw up above me. Yeah. Create the loop and let it drift. I don't yeah. do really good stripping flies. Really. <laughs> I do Sometimes. like skinny, fast water. I like that. Um what is it whenever whenever you're drifting and then it's it, on the swing it's on the it's swing on the, it's on the yeah. swing that yeah. swing is when i usually yeah. do well on that woolly booger that same trip for me with with then it was on the swing yeah it's on the swing of, a lot yeah. of times in this past uh couple weekends ago i took some guys up to uh up to uh, tennessee to gatlinburg yeah and it was all i caught three brown trout that day olive woolly booger with a tungsten head yeah and all of them were on it was on the final part of the drift and it was on the swing on the swing well, Ben, yeah. Ben, our friend uh, in, in North Alabama, he he would always say, you know, you do that swing and you just kind of let it sit there for about just a little bit of a second or two. Yep. And then that's when they'll a lot of times they'll hit that because it yeah. feels like they're it finally got out of the the current and out they're the kind of just looking upstream. Sitting on the seam, yeah. Yep. So I, that's how I do it. I, I've talked to a few people, you know, that that ask me how to look at water. Yeah. Which I mean, I fish small, small, skinny water, so yeah. you can look at it a lot better, but it's. I find where that run, smallmouth are lazy. Yeah. Probably the laziest fish there. <laughs> but they're going to sit 
where they don't want to have to move at all. Yeah. Unless it's to eat, and it's guaranteed to eat. So I watch where that seam is. If it comes off a rock, I don't find them sitting behind the rock. I find them sitting over to the side off the seam of that rock. So that's just how I do it, that's and I'll cool. swing it through. But it's like you said, it's it took me a while to figure this out. I actually figured it out like when I first started fly fishing. I didn't. I'm not a big reader. Yeah. I don't read a whole lot. I guess it sounds kind of ignorant, I guess, but I don't read a whole lot. I watch a lot of videos, but but I never seen anybody swing flies except for like salmon fishing. Yeah. You know, salmon fishing the same way, but it's all on that swing. I actually seen a picture the other day that like kind of shows how that swing works. So fish will sit here, and once it swings around, they'll move off that spot and hit it on the swing. Wow. But as soon as that swing stops, like I said, like you said, I'll, I'll leave it there for a second, and I pick that fly up. Yeah. I don't strip it back no. to me. Yeah. I just go back Start for it again. again. I'll stand out there and, and pick it apart, man. I'll work my way out and then work my way down and work my way back, and I'm just – I pick them apart. I saw – I, I was fishing with a guide in you know, Lake Ufala once, and he said that the best way to describe a fish is to think of it as a cat. Yeah. You just <laughs> lay around, Yep. and if something comes in front of them, they're going to eat it. And if they're hungry, they're going to go find food. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Other than that, there's just, a lot of truth to it. I know. Yeah. It's just I later. never heard that, but that is true. I know. Yeah. <laughs> it made a lot of sense after yeah. he said that. I mean, they so. just, and they're finicky. And they're finicky. Oh, they are. Yeah. <laughs> they, That's so funny. They upset me you can't a lot. trust them. <laughs> yeah. They can't be trusted. But yeah, it's, I, I've been fishing for about a month now, and I've caught two sunfish on the fly yeah not caught a single i caught my first smallmouth of the year wednesday yeah and it was on a on a spinning rod oh wow so i guess we count that but it's that time of year man it's we're, we're we've had a couple of fake springs couple yeah. Of, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's yeah. another cold snap yeah. right now but Sucked them out. i work I'm, on the good days and fish I'm, the bad days i know i know that's me too it's like yeah. i'm sitting there at work i was like it's 80 degrees out and sunny i'm thinking gosh it'd be a good day to be on the water yep. the day i'm off is 30 degrees and rainy. Yeah, yeah, 30 <laughs> degrees and rain and sideways. Andy, yeah. thanks, for, thanks for all you do. I love following your Instagram yeah, page. Yeah, y'all too, dude. I, I like what y'all do. Thanks, man. Appreciate it's, you stopping by. I like by. podcasts, but it's hard to find. It's hard to find one that you can kind of fit in with, I guess you could say, even if it's not fishing. Yeah. It's just something that's like down home. Yeah. So. Well, we try I to make it feel it. like a conversation. I appreciate, yeah, you, appreciate, I appreciate you stopping it. by today, buddy. Yeah, dude. All right, we finally were able to catch up with Robin Sims. She's a local celebrity. She is uh, no relation to the Sims Corporation, but is available for pro deals. And uh, <laughs> she is a part of a uh, the Alabama Women on the Fly, and she also has a new guide service that she is up and running. And we are so excited that she's a part of this Alabama fly fishing community. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, guys. I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> All right, so you have lived in Alaska, you've lived mm-hmm. all over, you've fished all over. We want to hear some fishing stories and hopefully a bear story, okay. if you've got always, one. Always up for a good bear story. Yep, I got, got a few of those for sure. Well, and uh, and we also want to hear about the great things you're doing with Alabama Women on the Fly, trying to make sure that we uh, are, more women are getting to be a part of this sport. So, uh, okay. yeah. You, it, the mic is yours. Take it away, right? Take it away. Take it away. All right. Uh, well, I guess I'll just start off with the, the humble beginnings. I grew up in Valley, Alabama. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> yeah, right on the Chattahoochee, on yeah, the banks I, I, there. I grew up in Ufala, right Oh, down my the road. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right down the street. Yeah. We catch bigger bass than you do in Ufala. So, I yeah, mean, you guys catch them before they get to Ufala. Exactly. <laughs> Some of them have some ulcers and a little like stinky like this going on from Chattahoochee runoff. Oh, but. we don't worry about that. <laughs> we don't need them. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, but we uh, we grew up on the Chattahoochee fishing. Uh, my whole family has been avid anglers, um, and we also from very early days in the 80s had a place on Lake Martin. So the Tallapoosa were very much part of my my upbringing and fishing and in, in, in my veins. Um, growing up as a wild kid running the riverbanks. Yep. And uh, <laughs> it was Roel. Oh, it's was Roel. Hey, hey Thanks, buddy. <laughs> just so anyone knows what just happened, Roel came to give me a little shoulder rub, and it was yep. a little awkward in the middle of my story, but <laughs> we'll continue on. Um, 
Yeah, so Talapusa, Chattahoochee, my family's grown up fishing that. My mom and dad are actually like a Bassmasters team for a little while. Really? So I kind of grew up waking up in the bass boat and like shotgun starts yeah. <laughs> as a kid. Oh, wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, and uh, just always been a traditional spin gear kind of gal and never really dabbled into fly fishing at all. Yeah. Um, I ended up uh, graduating high school, decided I went through a year of college at Troy and was like, you know what? not really quite my like gig for school right now I wasn't invested in it like I should have been like my parents hoped that I was yeah uh, and instead I decided to leave Alabama and go chase rivers and mountains wow. um, so I started off in West Virginia working at Itch West Resort as a like ski shop manager there which ski resort it, it's Snowshoe Mountain Snowshoe yeah that's where I grew up snow oh, skiing <laughs> I did I've probably been nine times <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome! Yeah, it's a pretty popular. It is. Popular. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's the East Coast, Southeast. Yeah. Place to go, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Best hills, best snow yeah. for yeah. sure in the Southeast. Um, I I was only there for maybe like a year or so before yeah. I was transferred out to Copper Mountain in yeah. Colorado. Wow. Um, as a ski shop supervisor out there because they're both owned by Interest Resorts. So that's how I kind of landed in Colorado. Wow. And then in the summertime, I was bored, got away from the ski resort area for the summer, and I learned to be a raft guide down on uh, oh, the Arkansas oh, that's River. Awesome. Yeah. And that's where I cut my teeth in whitewater. Um, started guiding out there on the Arkansas with uh, various different companies, river runners, and American Adventure Expedition, and some great, great folks out there that kind of showed me the ropes. Um, after about six years or so in Colorado, I, I dabbled a little bit in some fishing, but not enough to where I really picked it up full time. Yeah. I guided a lot out there for fishermen, um, not in the sense where they needed a fishing guide, but just someone to get them down the river. Yeah, you, you were the boat. Yeah, you I was the, the rowing girl. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. They didn't need my expertise on fishing, <laughs> yeah. which is fine with me. <laughs> I hey, got that's, to, a, that's a great thing to have. Sometimes <laughs> I wish I had that. Yeah. <laughs> I've always been a shuttle bunny, and I've always been like the row and the girl on the sticks just rowing people down the river. So I was okay with that. Um, and then I just, you know, everywhere you go, you kind of meet a collection of people in the community that have sort of similar stories of travels and places they've guided. And I kept hearing these amazing stories of people out in Alaska guiding. Yeah. And I was like, ah, oh, that's my next move. So that was the destination. That was it. That that set a fire in my yeah. belly. And I was like, I'm going to go to Alaska by myself. Me and my dog and my kayak. And I'm going to go, like, just experience this life, you know? Oh, my gosh. Um, so I, I headed so out no there. Plan. You just, no just like, plan. I'm going to Alaska. No. We'll figure it out. On Loaded up. This is, like, before I had a smartphone. Like, this is, this is back when you, like... Had an atlas to travel with. Printed out some map quest directions. And you actually got out of map. Yep. In my first year, my mom and dad sort of intervened on that plan. They're like, you are not driving to Alaska. So my dad flew out uh, to Colorado, helped me load up my car, and I had all my plants and everything else in the vehicle, and drove me back to Alabama to drop everything off. And I was like, all right. And then I flew out for the first year in Alaska. And I spent a year out there um, guiding uh, for Chilkat Guides, and we did an operation where we brought tourists to the base of a glacier, um, and they got to experience the glacier and, and hike around the base of the glacier by canoe for that one. Um, Let's hop right there for sure. just a second. I absolutely love being on the water in a, like a kayak or a canoe. Yeah. You can see so much more of what's around you, I feel yeah. like. It's just everything kind of slows down, and you can soak it all in a little bit better. Absolutely. I love that. I bet I can't imagine being at the foot of a glacier. Yeah, and, and that's the that. thing is, like, the, the area we guided on my first year in Alaska was a deglaciated area yeah. um, from the Davidson Glacier. It's called Glacier Point. So the lake that we were on was a glaciated lake, and it was sort of self-contained by this fan of land the glacier has pushed out as it's receded back um, and while you're on that lake in these Voyager canoes which hold about 12 or so cruise ship passengers yeah. wow. enormous yeah you've got catabatic winds blowing into your face from the glacier and they're like probably I don't know 30 knot winds like insane oh. gusts that come at you freezing cold oh. and they just like pound into you so it was a challenge at the same time but you're trying to enjoy the beauty because you got bear sightings everywhere and eagles swooping around you and a big glacier in front of you so it's a oh. real wild moment 
But as a guide, I'm just praying to God my people are going to... Yeah. <laughs> don't, just get everyone yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't fall out. <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull your 250 pounds back into the boat right away. <laughs> um, so there's moments of that where you just obviously like have all that running through your head. But it is magical. And it does slow you down to really absorb the scenery and everything that surrounds you. And I feel that way about the river still, no yeah. matter where I am. It doesn't have to be Alaska. It doesn't have to be Colorado. Yeah. Colorado was like complete opposite. We're in the midst of the white water, so everything yeah. happens super fast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's one of those moments that really soaks into your soul. Mm. And I daydream, daydream about it constantly still. Um, Good. Was it, when, did you start fishing more when you were out there? So when I started working out like in Alaska as a guide on my off time, yeah, I did a lot of fishing, uh, a lot of Dolly Varden up in those like mountain lake areas. Um, there was a ton of, of really good like Arctic char fishing and stuff around the, the coast uh, yeah. where a lot of these tributaries would come in. And we also worked on the Chilkat River, which was uh, a bald eagle preserve. Oh. And so we had these salmon runs that happened almost year round, not year round, but the big salmon run happens later in the, in the season. Um, sometimes as late as like snowfalls in, in November. Yeah. But the way this kettle moraine is laid out with this, um, the gravel, it holds onto the water. So it warms up all that water from the rock. And so those salmon are coming in later than usual in other places. So those bald eagles congregate around that area. There's it's like 5,000 bald eagles right here in this one Five area. 5,000? Can you wow. imagine? Yeah, oh so my. it's a bald eagle preserve. It's a Chilkat River, and it's insane. So if anyone gets a moment to go to Alaska to experience something phenomenal, that's the place. Because you... <laughs> go to Idaho and then go Pacific Northwest we'll just keep on going to Alaska yeah, it's we'll outside of there. Haines Alaska it's insane <laughs> and then of course if you think there's eagles there's salmon there's also gonna be bear yeah and that's where the magic happens is like when the bears come out for all these salmon everywhere you know we'll be floating down the river in the raft and you you're in a braided river Delta and it's like a mile wide yeah so you see things for you know 500 yards away yeah and you can't tell but there's dealt like braided rivers in between you and that object mm. the object happens to be a bear all of a sudden it stands up to see what you are as you're wrapped, like floating oh. down in your raft is there ever a time that oh, you got charged so many times oh. so they like hit the ground hard and they start doing their bluff charge and they just yeah. like huff and like boom, 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 run towards you and all of a sudden, like, they realize, oh, there's a river in front of me and you. Like, I'm not getting there. So it was a real wow moment for a lot of our passengers yeah. on the trip. Um, and it happened, it happened, you know, every every so often. It wasn't a frequent thing, so it was still exciting for us as guides, too. Yeah. Um, but that's that's the least of my bear stories. <laughs> just the that's charge. just a sighting, yeah. Oh, <laughs> a blood good. charge from 500 yards away. Nothing crazy. <laughs> um but, you know, in the mix of my Alaska adventures, I got on board with uh, Alaska Fishing Game. Okay. And I uh, started working with those guys on some of the telemetry projects they have with some of the salmon um, on the Susitna River. And it's mm -hmm. funny because uh, a while ago I heard Hank's story with you guys. Yeah. And it just so happens I was on the same project as Hank just a year before him. Really? Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, he, he shared his bear story from when he was there. And it's, I mean, that's where the bear action happens. Uh, I happen to be working on fish wheels on the Susitna River, which are giant contraptions that are propelled by the force of the water flowing down. Yeah. And they rotate the wheels, and as the wheel rotates around underwater, the basket scoops up the fish as they're swimming upstream and dumps them into a slide that holds them into a box. We collect them out of that holding box, and we sample the fish and take all of our scales and DNA and everything and then release them. Um, sometimes the bears get out there before we do. <laughs> oh, I bet. That's just, so, that's just that's just like a picnic basket for them. Yeah, I think Hank was working on one of the weirs maybe when he had his bear encounter. A lot of our bear encounters happen on the fish wheel. Um, so the, the scariest one, though, happened to be at camp, which was just on a hill. Uh -huh. um, me being the only female in the whole group of the scientific... Um, um, group of people they call them scientific de technicians what we were uh, I was separated from them as far as my camp goes so I was right. up on top of the bluff and they were down next to the river 
Um, being from Alabama, I was the only gal <laughs> that had, well, the only person in the group that was really comfortable with the shotgun. <laughs> so they gave me the shotgun to keep in my tent. I don't know if they did that to make me feel better or because they were just nervous about having the shotgun in their tent. Yeah. Either way, I was happy to have it. Um, one morning, it was probably three in the morning, it's broad daylight because it's Alaska. Um, I go get woken up by... That seems like it would be disorienting at first. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I guess you get used to about anything, but like the, that kind of daylight's got to be disorienting. It's nice because you're not scared to a point in the dark camping out in the middle of nowhere, Alaska. Right. right. Because it's always daylight. You can right. see around you. But in your tent, you try to black everything out. So you're going to have a tarp and everything else trying to like block that light out so you can sleep right right well i woke up to this big giant thing rubbing against my tent and i was thinking so you a bear is <laughs> oh, rubbing yeah. up against like your a tent. shoulder rub right into my tent just get a little scratch well at first i was like oh these guys are messing with me this is like my second week here they're trying to scare me i was yeah. like oh this is gonna be real funny when i you know i pull the shotgun Draft out the shotgun. yeah and so <laughs> <laughs> any oakley out here <laughs> i sat there for a minute like my heart's pounding all of a sudden, I see a claw and a paw on oh, my tent. On like, the tent? Run down it. Like, That's like some... A light scratch. Not like a not like a gash it open kind of thing, but just Did slowly, just like, like yeah, poking That's at like it. Just horror movie scene there. Exactly. Oh, and I was like, oh, my God, this is happening. <laughs> so I, I'm like, fellas, like, hello. And then this bear didn't even scare off. He's just like, oh, what's going on here? I hear him gruffing. He's like, you know, rumbling around and making his gruffing noise. And I'm like, all right, guys, like, I'm about to pull the shotgun out. There's a bear up here. And this bear's still just nudging into my tent, sniffing around. So I zip the back door open. I can't see him because he's around the front side of my tent. I cock the shotgun, and I just let one go. <laughs> I just was like, You're boom. Brave. I would have shot through the tent. I had no choice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Forget, I'm gonna, the, forget the tent. I'm going to need a tent and a new pair of pants. I didn't want to even deal with that mess. <laughs> I've been, I've been, you know, with my dad's getting deers enough where I didn't want to do a bear. So. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to wound him. I didn't yeah. want to have to do the paperwork either with the state. So. Yeah, true. That's very true. <laughs> anyway, that bear took off running. I saw his back end just hot-tailing it. It was a young bear, too. Was it a grizzly? It was, yeah, well, it was a coastal brown bear. So oh, we, it's wow. the same genetic makeup as a grizzly. Yeah. They just have different habitats that kind of give them different characteristics of behavior. Wow. Um, but, yeah, young guy took off running or gal and uh, luckily we put a bear fence up after that week because we have a little electric fence we can put up around our camp just so that you know if they come once we know they're going to come again yeah. they kind of get habitual to some of our stuff and they want to come back again and again and again but i think that's my i think that's my nightmare <laughs> Either waking up, there's it's the claw thing. A claw oh, on that, the fence. that's what set it in for me too. Yeah, because yeah. I was like, these guys aren't messing with me. Like this is really happening. Yeah. And I was like, I've trained for this. Like I, I got no, I'm okay. Like yeah. deep breath. Like you yeah. got this. Like just scare it away. Just scare it away. You know. I had bear spray with me too. Not that I would really want to pull that out anyway. But yeah. yeah. That's t- yeah. I, you still gotta. There's a step after the bear spray. <laughs> You know? <laughs> well, this is a step before the bear spray. Right. <laughs> I'm the jumping bear- right to the good stuff. <laughs> skip the bear spray. Yeah, yeah, oh, man, exactly. Straight to the warning shot. Yeah. The it was pretty hard to sleep for several weeks after that, though. Just, you know, oh, being on, on the end, a little nervous. And, yeah. Um, I just didn't want to have any more face face encounters with any wildlife while no. I was there. And so. I could, I- I get it. I get it. I tell you Luckily, what, it was the last one for that summer. I think we need to have a, like a whole like ep- not a live episode like this, but have Robin come on the podcast with us. <laughs> oh yeah, I've got like, a few more like stories for sure. I feel, I feel we like got a lot more. more to work through here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I know uh, we're pretty excited about this film. Uh, have you oh, seen yeah. it? Oh yeah, I've seen it like four times now. So I haven't. We haven't seen it yet. I haven't so seen it yet. It never gets old. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think they're probably about to. They're start fired the, up soon. All right. Up soon, yeah. Can we pick back up once they're done with Mary Beth? Yeah. And we'll talk about that. some Alabama cool. winter. We can, uh, right. Yeah, we can. We can. We can do whatever we need to. All right. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. Hey, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Real quickly, tell us one second about the um, Alabama Women on the Fly. Okay. So Alabama Women on the Fly is basically. Um, Something we feel the state has needed for a while. Yeah. Um, there's no women's fly fishing group that we are aware of that we could find. There are some local groups here and there, but nothing statewide. So Mary Beth and I are trying to come together to 
be a catalyst to bring women into the community of people that taught us everything we know. So cool. Awesome. And so we cool. want to make that connection with everyone okay. um, and give them the tools that we were so graciously given to get off the ground, started fly fishing in the state, and, Love it. and build that community. Awesome. So we awesome. really want to bring like the whole family dynamic into the fly fishing scene for everyone. So. Well, I cannot wait to hear some stories with you and Mary Beth. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much Thank for you joining us, Robin. Yeah, of course. Nice. Thank you. Excellent. Well, we hope you enjoyed those stories. Uh, we are we were so excited to be able to share those with you. Uh, there were some pretty funny stories, yeah. some yes. a little bit of uh, nerve wracking stories, especially from you know, Robin's standpoint. Um, but yeah, I mean, Andre, I, I will never look at a uh, a squirrel the same after hearing <laughs> that story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. for sure. It was uh, it was so much fun just to meet all of them, and I was uh, was overwhelmed um, by the amount of people that came by our table. We had uh, a good friend of mine, Keenan Dollar. I'll give Keenan a shout out, and then, uh, yep. he uh, made me this uh, this really cool steel. Keenan made that. Keenan, yeah, oh, Keenan made that. I love that. Cut out the the storied outdoors and a steel piece of plate steel, and we had that laying on our table. And, uh, you know, it was a white table, so it contrasted, made it look really cool. And um, people would come by, and they're like, oh, man, I listened to your podcast. You know, we love what you do. Please keep doing what you're doing. Yep. That that meant a lot to us, you know. Cause and it happened a bunch, too. It like It wasn't like four or five people. It, it was like, wow, yeah. I'm blown away. I was blown away by the support and encouragement. Yeah, you know, and we were just so thankful to uh, Steve and others that were um, yes. allowed us to come and be yes. on uh, as a part of the, one of those vendors. And, um, you know, I wish that we could have sat there and told stories all day long. Um, but just, you know, there was other people to see. And, and I, I think that I think that it was a fun addition to the film festival. Yeah. Um, would love to do it again. I hope we get to do that again. Yeah. Um, man, just seeing Brandon um yep brandon um is it brandon bales yeah, brandon bales and uh, uh stephen rockerts and mary beth meeks and matt, uh, lewis. matt lewis and then the film we got to see the film i've only seen clips of the slam that saves and uh, we got to s- stand and watch the the full film it's like 10 minutes but then yeah. i i hear i hear tale that there's a director's cut oh it's gonna it's gonna release sometime soon i think on the on the youtubes well, I cannot so, wait to see that. I can't that. wait to see that. So I'm sure there'll be some elements from Mary Beth's interview, i.e. the U-Haul truck <laughs> incident that'll probably, maybe maybe that'll make the director's cut of the slam that saves. But it was so encouraging to see an Alabama film mm. with Alabama anglers in Alabama highlight how great a state that we live in and the beautiful places that there are to fly fish here in the state of Alabama. You know, and I think, I think that's what made it special this year. I, I love the fly fishing film festival and the fly fishing tour. Yeah. Um, two, two different events that we've both, we've had both of them in Birmingham and, uh, I love, I love them every time they come by, but man, this was a special yeah. year because of the Alabama connection. Absolutely. Man, the, the place was, it was electric in there. There were tons of, uh, tons of anglers and people came out. There were lots of, Man, what an amazing pile of giveaways they had. Good grief. They, had they gave just, away some amazing just stuff. Just a table full, and I was holding my little ticket, and it would be like, eight, zero, and I'd get all excited, and it wouldn't be our number. <laughs> um, but uh, we were... <laughs> so it is with the raffle tickets. <laughs> so it is with the raffle tickets. But man, best part of the show, watching that kid win that kayak. That, you know, hopefully that will be a, a long, well-used kayak I think that, will. you know, for make an impression on him. That that was really cool. It was awesome. It you was, know, one of the things that um, we talked a little bit about Mary, Mary Beth and we talked about Robin. At the end of Robin's episode, we were really hoping to get Mary Beth over to our, our booth to sit down and tell some stories. But, you know, that's the price you pay for being a celebrity. Yeah, yeah well, you know, big, kind of a big deal. When you're kind of a big yeah, deal a big movie deal. star like Mary <laughs> Beth, people want a little piece of your time. That's right. But, hey, how about this? 
as a consolation prize, we're going to get Mary Beth and Robin on their own episode together. 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 So. Team up. We'll team up. And I can't wait to hear some stories from uh, from that pair. And uh, gosh, it was so fun. I had so <laughs> much fun, man. Uh, we got some flies. Paul Terry gave us some awesome flies that he made. Paul Terry, what a generous guy and a talented uh, fly tire. Uh, gave us some amazing bugs. I'm almost afraid to use yeah, them. I don't even they look efficient. they look so good. Um, man, but fun. don't want don't want those to get beat up because they look so good. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Brandon also uh, gave us some flies. Fixed us up with some uh, small creek flies. Yeah, those man. are incredible too. It's that time of year, man. It's time to get in the water. Yep. The little crawfish that I love so much. What an art! What well, just an art form. The way he ties flies and he, all of those guys. I mean, everybody there was so talented. Mary Beth's artwork was in beautiful, and uh, there were other artists there. It was just a great vibe. The whole event was fantastic. Stephen, though, put on a wonderful event, and uh, we were just super honored to be a part of it. And I felt so encouraged by all the people that uh, all of you guys that listen. Um, I'll tell you what, though, so many of you came by and said some very, very kind things that man were honestly wind in my creative sails to mm. sort of keep doing this podcast you know yeah it is work but man we're really enjoying what we do i would love it if uh if some of you if you're listening right now if you would take time to uh to go leave us a review i'm telling you those reviews man they really really help us uh grow this podcast yep. and spread the word um if you want you know, our, our podcast to uh, to be found by more people, if you want more people to hear about folks like Matt Lewis or Wade Blevins or Mary Beth Meeks, like if you want their stories to be heard better, the one thing you can do to help is leave a review. Leave us a written review and a rating, and the more of those that we have, the higher up on searches our podcast is, and the more people will find out about those stories. And uh, we are so thankful to share those stories. Yeah, there's there's an algorithm at play with with some of these things, and and you know the more uh, ratings and reviews of five stars or and, and you know positive reviews, we don't yeah, want. Listen, if you don't I like don't it, just need, keep that to yourself. We don't need <laughs> we don't need this two star business. No, so. <laughs> but um, but that if it's a if it helps more people to see it, it shows up on yes. there. Hey, you may like this yes, feed, yes. so. Yeah, that's that's the reason we ask for those, and it's a lot of fun to to read your thoughts and um, you know, and it's I don't know, it's a great um, it's a great way to encourage this podcast yes. if that's if that's something that you're interested in doing. Yeah, man. Well, uh, it's I was certainly encouraged by the weekend at the uh, the film festival, watching the films, meeting the people, and. Uh, and seeing that community and how uh, rich that Alabama fly fishing community is um, was deeply encouraging. And, and we look forward to continuing to tell those stories. You know, this season has been so interesting in, in that we've been, we've, we've kind of vacillated between sort of two camps, mm-hmm. the, the sort of a, a rabbit room camp, if you will, of yep. guys like Pete uh, Peterson uh, or the guys from Wolfbane or yep. Sam Smith. Yep. Um, and then we've had Matt and Mary Beth. And, and so. Hey, and it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. There are more. There's more. But wait, there's more. But wait, there's more. <laughs> this is not an infomercial. And you don't even have to send 1999. <laughs> four easy payments. Just four easy payments, yeah. No, it's just free and it's coming your way. And um, there's a lot more to come. And we're excited about that. Yeah, um, got a good rest of the season, and I mean, you know, just a little bit of a foreshadowing here while we're just sitting here chatting. This summer is going to be special. No, hey, and some of you are sitting on an essay, and you haven't written one yet. You're like, I think I would like to do that. Man, sit down at your desk, open up your computer, and start telling your story. Yep, uh, we would love. Man, we'd be so honored if you'd share a story with us. And it, maybe it'll be one of the ones that we choose to be a part of our summer essay, guest essay, and guest writers uh, episodes this summer. So I'm super excited about that. Man, you know, we've already got several that, that we're going to be, um, that we've we've chosen that are, are definitely going to be in. But there's room for more. Oh, certainly. And, um, you know, if you think, if you're sitting there thinking, 
I don't know if this is an essay. I don't know. Write it down. Give give me something to work with, and we can edit this thing, and we can massage it, and it'll be something that you're really proud of to have in written form, and yes, then yes. even more so whenever Brad reads it, it's going to be digitally archived for uh, for years and years to come. So, yeah, just don't be afraid of what you think it may or may not be. Who cares? It's your story. We need to get it out there. Yeah. So, yeah, get out there and do it. I know it can be scary. I personally know it can be scary. And you're like, oh, I don't, I'm not a great writer and all that, but you have a great story. So sit down, carve it out, and uh, and, and send it to us. You can send those to uh, the storied outdoors at gmail.com. And uh, we'd love to. And I I can think of nothing better than to, uh, to flip on my computer, go check my storied outdoors email, and find some essays waiting for me there. Mm. That'd be amazing. So so take some time to do that. That'd be awesome. Well, Brad, I think it's time to stoke the fire. It's time to stoke the fire. And wrap this one up. I got my uh I got one of those uh it's a fire poker that has a hole all the way through it and a mouthpiece like a trumpet. I learned about this from our good friend Hugh Cheek. <laughs> We've learned a lot from We've Hugh. We've learned a lot from <laughs> Hugh. Continue to learn a lot from Hugh. But man, I, I got my fire poker and I can get I can put some air in the bottom of that fire without burning my face off. What's it called? It's a dragon The Dragon's Breath. Dragon's breath. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna enjoy the rest of our evening. But uh we hope you enjoy this podcast and these stories. If you do, please take some time to leave us a review. If you uh, have a comment or you think there's there's someone that you would think would be great, a great guest on our podcast. Uh, shoot us an email at the storied outdoors at gmail.com. Also, um, there's a lot of great uh, additional content on the storied outdoors.com. Um, each episode has an accompanying page where uh, they have photos, uh, additional stories, and links to all their things like Matt Lewis's book or Mary Beth's store where you can buy Mary Beth's art. Each of them have a, uh, an individual page under the interviews tab on the storiedoutdoors.com. You can also email us from that. And we would also love it if you joined our, um, our newsletter list. We don't send out a ton. We know you get lots of emails um, every day. And so we're not going to inundate you with emails. I promise. I don't want them. You don't want them, but we will send out the occasional little update. Here's what's going on, and uh, you'll get first dibs on things uh, coming up in the future. Um, You'll be the ones that give a little heads up as to what the season's going to look like. So if you like like to be in the know about what's coming up, uh, rather than just waiting on it to show up in your your iTunes or your Spotify playlist, you can kind of know ahead of time. Hey, here's uh, here's what's coming this coming season. So the only way to do that is going to be through the newsletter. And, uh, and you'll get uh, additional content and additional writing and encouragements and, um, and various and a sundry <laughs> collections of photos and things from adventures from the Storied Outdoors uh, on the Storied Outdoors newsletter. Um, so that, I think that's all I got, man. It's going to be a great night. We're going to close it out. We hope uh, these stories encourage you. Um all the stories from the the film festival we hope they challenge you to sit down at your computer sit down with your journal write your own stories uh, to get your boat out like we uh, did today and share your own adventures in the place that we love to call the storied outdoors